The Dozer School for Boys, also known as the Florida School for Boys, was a reform school operated by the state of Florida in the town of Marina from January 1st, 1900 to June 30th, 2011. For a while, it was the largest juvenile reform institution in the United States. A second campus was opened in the town of Okabee in 1955. Throughout its 111-year history, the school gained a reputation for abuse, beatings, rapes, torture, and even murder of students by staff. Despite periodic investigations, changes of leadership, and promises to improve, the allegations of cruelty and abuse continued. Many of the allegations were confirmed by separate investigations by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in 2010 and in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice in 2011. State authorities closed the school permanently in June 2011. From its opening until the 1980s, the marina site was an open campus without any perimeter fencing. The site was originally divided into two sub-campuses, South Side, or number one, for the white students, and North Side, or number two, for the colored students, who were segregated from the white students until 1966. A cemetery was located on the North Side, which contains the graves of more than 50 deceased students. At the time of the Justice Department investigation in 2010 through 2011, Dozer was a fenced 159-acre high-risk facility for 104 boys aged 13 to 21 who had been committed by a court. Their average length of stay at Dozer was 9 to 12 months. They lived in several cottages, with each boy having an unlocked room. Next door was the Jackson Juvenile Offender Center a minimum risk facility for chronic offenders guilty of felonies or violent crimes which house residents in single locked cells like a prison. In 1903 an inspection reported that children at the school were commonly kept in leg irons. A fire in the dormitory at the school in 1914 killed six inmates and two staff members. In 1968 Florida Governor Claude Kirk said after a visit to the school where he found overcrowding and poor conditions that somebody should have blown the whistle a long time ago. At this time the school housed 564 boys. Some for offenses as minor as school truancy, running away from home, or incorrigibility. They ranged in age from 10 to 16 years old. Officially Corporal punishment at the school was banned in August 1968. In 1982, an inspection revealed that some of the boys at the school were hogtied and kept in isolation for weeks at a time, and the ACLU filed a lawsuit over this and similar mistreatment. By this time, the school housed 105 boys aged 13 to 21. In 1985, it was reported that young ex-inmates of the school, sentenced to jail terms for crimes they committed while there, had subsequently been the victims of torture at the Jackson County Jail. The method of torture was for the prison guards to handcuff the teenagers and then hang them from the bars of their cells, sometimes for over an hour. The guards stated that their superiors approved the practice and that it was routine. In April 2007, the acting superintendent of the school and one of the other employees were fired following allegations of abuse of inmates. In late 2009, the school failed its annual inspection. Among other problems, the inspector found that the school failed to deal properly with the large number of complaints from the boys held there, including allegations of mistreatment by the guards. In a report published by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2010, 11.3% of the boys surveyed at the school reported they had been the subject of sexual misconduct by staff using force in the last 12 months. 
and 10.3% reported that they had been subject to it without the use of force. 2.2% reported sexual victimization by another inmate. The state decided to close both facilities on June 30th, 2011. The remaining students were sent to other juvenile justice facilities around the state. The White House. In 1929, an 11-room concrete block detention building containing two cells, one for white and one for black students, was constructed to house incorrigible or violent students. It was eventually nicknamed the White House. After corporal punishment at the school was abolished in 1968, the building was used for storage. In 2008, in response to the allegations of beatings and torture that took place there, state officials sealed the building in a public ceremony, leaving a memorial plaque. It has remained empty since that time. According to former inmates who had been incarcerated at the school in the 1950s and 1960s, who described themselves as the White House Boys, the school became the subject of an extensive special report entitled For Their Own Good, published by the St. Petersburg Times in 2009. Allegations Focusing on this 1960s time period include claims that one room was used for whipping the white boys and another for the black. The whippings were carried out with a three-foot-long belt made of leather and metal and were thorough enough that the recipient's underwear became embedded into their skin. One inmate said that the punishments were severe but justified. Another claimed that he had seen a boy trapped in a running laundry dryer at the school and suspected that the boy was killed. One former inmate claimed that he was punished in the White House 11 times, receiving a total of over 250 lashes. Others alleged that they were whipped until they lost consciousness and that the punishments were made harsher for boys that cried. Some former inmates also claimed that there was a rape room at the school where they were sexually abused. The complaints said that some of the victims were as young as nine years old. On December 9, 2008, Florida Governor Charlie Crist directed the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to investigate the allegations of abuse, torture, and murder brought forward by the White House boys. Over 100 interviews of former students, family members of former students, and former staff members of the school were conducted during the 15-month investigation, which produced no concrete evidence linking any of the students' deaths. It was determined that the 31 graves at the facility that had been dug between 1914 and 1952 to the actions of school staff or that there had been any attempts to conceal deaths. None of the graves were opened during the investigation. A forensics examination of the White House building was conducted no trace evidence of blood on the walls was found. Some former Dozier students told investigators that they felt they needed the discipline. Troy Tidwell, who was a staff member at the school at the time, said that the punishments in the White House building were not extensive and were carried out with the leather strap because there were concerns that spankings with wooden paddles might injure the boys. In January 2010, the Department of Law Enforcement released its findings. The interviews confirmed that school administrators use corporal punishment as a tool to encourage obedience. The interviews revealed little disagreement about the way in which corporal punishment was administered. The former students were consistent in that punishment was administered by school administrators and adult staff witnesses in the building referred to as the White House. The former students were consistent in stating that a wooden paddle or leather strap was the implement used for administering punishment. The area of disagreement amongst former students was the number of spankings administered and their severity. Although some former students stated that they were beaten to the point that the skin on their backsides blistered and bled profusely, there was little or no evidence of visible residual scarring. A secondary disagreement 
was the former student's perception of the punishment progress. Some former students stated that their spankings caused them no physical harm and that they learned from their mistakes, while others stated that mentally they suffered greatly as a result and still do to this day. Some reports by former students stated that in addition to the corporal punishment, they were also victims of sexual abuse at the hands of former staff members or other students. With the passage of over 50 years, no tangible physical evidence was found to either support or refute the allegations of physical or sexual abuse. On March 11, 2010, State Attorney Glenn Hess announced that no criminal charges would be filed in the case. In its December 2011 report of its investigation at the Dozier School, the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice made the following findings about staff at the school who were cited for use of excessive force, inappropriate isolation, and extension of confinement. The youth confined at Dozier School and at JJOC were subject to conditions that placed them at serious risk of avoidable harm in violation of their rights protected by the Constitution of the United States. During our investigation, we received credible reports of misconduct by staff members to youth within their custody. The allegations revealed systemic, egregious, and dangerous practices exacerbated by the lack of accountability and controls. These systemic deficiencies exist because state policies and generally accepted juvenile justice procedures were not being followed. We found that staff did not receive minimally adequate training. We also found that proper supervision and accountability measures were limited and did not suffice to prevent undue restraint and punishments. Staff failed to report allegations of abuse to the state supervisors and administrators. Staff members often failed to accurately describe the use of force incidents and properly record the use of mechanical restraints. Aaron Kimmerly is a forensic anthropologist and University of South Florida associate professor who is leading a USF team of anthropologists, biologists, and archaeologists exploring the marina campus. The stories of the White House boys piqued her interest. She was especially curious as to why there are no records of where those who died there are buried. Kimberly commented, When you look at the state hospital, state prisons, other state institutions at the time, there are very meticulous plot maps you can reference. Or if you are a family member today, you can say, Where is my great aunt buried? and they can show you exactly where. So why didn't that happen here? I don't know, but that does stand out. The team used ground penetrating radar and excavations to identify where the bodies are buried. However, in order to determine if the cause of death was from illness, injury, or murder, the bodies must be exhumed, which can be done only if a family member requests it. By December 2012, the researchers indicated that there are at least 50 graves on the grounds and that a second cemetery is likely to exist. On August 6, 2013, Governor Rick Scott and the Florida Cabinet issued a permit allowing the University of South Florida anthropologist and archaeologist to excavate and examine the remains of any and all boys buried at the Dozier site. Robert Staley a spokesman for the White House boys, said that the school segregated white and black inmates and that the remains are located where black inmates were held. He suspects there is another white cemetery that hasn't been discovered. He says, I think that there are at least a hundred more bodies up there. At some point they were going to find more bodies. I'm dead certain of that. There has to be a white graveyard on that white side. By the 26th of September 2014, the remains of three boys, George Owen Smith, 
reported missing since 1940. Thomas Varnado reportedly died of pneumonia in 1934. And Earl Wilson, died in 1944, had been identified. George Owen Smith University of South Florida forensics experts announced August 7, 2014, that for the first time they have identified the remains of a boy buried at the Dozier site, School for Boys. The researchers said that they used DNA and other tests to identify the remains of George Owen Smith, who was 14 when he disappeared from the Reform School in 1940. They couldn't say how Smith died. Official records indicate 31 burials at the school, but researchers found the remains of 55 people during a four-month excavation last year. Researchers said that Smith's body was found in a hastily buried grave wrapped only in a burial shroud. His remains, DNA matched a sample taken from his sister. USF officials said that his mother wrote the school superintendent, Millard Davison, in December 1940, asking about her son. She got a letter back saying that no one knew where he was. Thomas Barnado, a 13-year-old boy sent to the school in 1934 for trespassing, dies 38 days after arriving there. There is a photograph of Thomas Fornado, a black and white family portrait taken in late 1925. Thomas is four years old. He's wearing a Peter Pan collar and breeches. He is squinting against the light. His, he's barefoot like his big brother Hubert, who was standing behind Thomas. It is the only photograph of Thomas his family has. The Hernando County Sheriff came for Thomas and Hubert nine years later, in 1934. They had been accused of stealing a typewriter from an old maid, and they were charged with malicious trespassing. They were not represented by a lawyer, nor were they tried. Their parents protested, but couldn't stop the sheriff, who shipped the boys that September to the Marina Reformatory, which by then had a brick-making plant, printing press, and a farm, all of which relied on child labor. Thirty-four days later, Thomas, 13, who had left home in good health, was dead. The campus newspaper, The Yellow Jacket, reported the news under a front-page story about the school's productive dairy farm. Thomas Varnado claimed by death. On Thursday, October 26th, at 2.51 p.m., Thomas Varnado, age 13, succumbed to an attack of pneumonia, which had been threatening his life for several days. It was stated Thomas had been in ill health for several years, but that his health seemed to be improving after his arrival at the school on September 22nd. On Sunday, October 21st, he went to the school hospital complaining that he was feeling bad, and he was kept there and given medical attention. It said the little fellow's vitality was so greatly lowered from his protected illness that he failed to respond readily to treatment and later developed pneumonia. Thomas is the son of Mr. and Mrs. T. H. Fornado of Hernando County. Upon his arrival at school, he was placed in College One and assigned to the yard crew for work. He has a brother, Hubert, in Cottage Three at the present time. Five dignitaries, all former Jackson County Chamber of Commerce Citizens of the Year winners, gathered in front of the county courthouse in Marina the same day Thomas Fornado died. They complained that out-of-towners were sullying their reputation. The Citizens of the Year blamed the media for unfairly linking Marina and Jackson County to the Dozier School. But they also defended the school and tried to discredit the former wards. Earl Wilson no photo provided. Earl Wilson was said to have been beaten to death in 1944, reportedly by four other boys while in a small confinement cottage on the property known as the Sweatbox. The other boys were convicted in his death. There are more bodies to be exhumed at Dozier. There are more stories to be told.